Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Bradley. I've got two assistants uh, somewhere in the crowd that's holding two velvet bags. Can I just ask them to stand up? Guys, can you just come down to the front, please, to the front two rows? I'm going to ask you to trust me just for a moment, and that may depend on the contents of the bag when it comes back, OK? But I'm going to ask you to trust me. Uh, just during the presentation, my two uh, trusty steeds here, uh, Ryan and Adam, say hi, guys. Hello. OK, Ryan and Adam are going to just pass a bag to this gentleman sitting on the left-hand side here. So if, while I'm talking, you guys can just get some change out of your pockets, if you can, oblige me. The bag's going to get passed along. It's going to go to the top, and then we'll count the presentation. Um, I'm going to start off with, with the sentence that you can see on the screen, uh, which is, do not ever tell anybody. Do not ever let anybody tell you that you cannot do something. And uh, I've got a private blog, personal blog, which everybody can see, and there's a film, In Pursuit of Happiness, and I don't know if you guys have seen it. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. In Pursuit of Happiness. You know the part when he's gone through all this adversity, poor Will Smith and his kid in the toilet, and he's held the toilet shut, and he and he goes to, to work in the stockbrokers, and uh, I, I think it's 40 people, and he gets the job, he's unpaid for six months. When he comes out, he comes down the steps, doesn't he? And this feeling that he has, you know, when he comes down the steps, and the look on his face, and just the, just the sheer, you know, I, I've done it, you know, and he races to see his child. I think, for me, that sums up every single part of an entrepreneur's journey, for me personally, that feeling. Some people are looking for money, some people are looking for fame and fortune. And for me, you know, it's just that feeling. That, that's what it's all about, that, that, that we did it, that we got there as a team. OK, just a little bit about me, just a, a brief background. Uh, a business family, my parents were involved in, in the rag trade, my father was uh, in market stalls and my mother was in boutiques. I had this contrast between, you know, my dad on market stalls, you know, 4 99 5 99 come on, girls, and my mum selling sort of Frank, Frank Usher and Clars and dresses at a £1,000 a time. So I had this real big contrast between working in the East End of London markets and you know, this upper-end, fantastic, high-class boutiques in, in Loun and Chigwell. Um, but it was actually as a, a young boy, actually, watching my dad when he used to buy clothing uh, for Obermakes, as it were. And I used to look at the people that I used to do business with and I could see instinctively and I could understand body language when people were perhaps comfortable, out of their comfort zone, when they were perhaps lying uh, or telling the truth, or indeed felt awkward about uh, something. So I, I realised as, as a young man I, I had that ability. Um, I always had this dream that I wanted to work in the stock market, and you can probably tell I'm, I'm quite nutty. It's very hard to get me to stand still, but I'm really struggling to stand beyond this podium because, you know, normally when I'm, I'm all over the place, so I've been told I must stay here. So I wanted to go into the stock market. I was told it wasn't possible. I wanted to be a blue button. I wrote to every single broker firm in the city and got a no because I just got GCSEs. I'm, you know, a B, C, D, average guy. We need A-levels, we need degrees. Well, after writing to every single person in the Stock Exchange member book and getting and turned away, I didn't give up. I then went back, started interviewing. Um, I got interviews uh, in the post room, whatever I could do to get onto the stock market floor. But when I went into the post room, I couldn't control my ambition. You want to go on the dealing floor? I'm sorry, you'll never get out of the post room, son. So I couldn't get a job in the stock market. The post room wouldn't take me because, <laughs> Christ, you know, my ambitions were too high. And I couldn't, I didn't have the qualifications to get on the floor. Persistence beats resistance any day of the week and twice on a Sunday. And I kept going, I kept going. Until one day, I was in a mess, uh, uh, I was in an exam, and my mum rang up, you've got to come out, you've got to come now, you've got two interviews, you're going to go to James Cable and Nat West. So I've got my best Burton suit on, and me, polished up my shoes, you know, and I was trundled in, and by now I've had four or five interviews, I've been turned away, I've been rejected, and I thought, right, that's it, you know, I'm going to blow these people away. Trundled up there, had an interview at Nat West, got offered the job, I didn't know at the time, but it didn't inspire me, the guy wasn't inspiring. Went into James Cable, and I went in, I saw an HR lady, and she's scratching her, you know, and I'm, I'm confident now, and probably a little bit arrogant. She went, bear with me one moment, I've got to get somebody else. Next person comes in, and it's now a, a, a dealer, you know, 250K, 300K a year salary, back in, you know, back in, you know, when that was serious money. He saw me for 30 minutes, scratched his chin, he said, I've got to get someone else. And then, my God, as if Darth Vader didn't walk through the door. <laughs> This towering guy was seven foot tall and just as wide. And I've got to be honest with you, I was quaking. This was the daddy of the dealing floor. Everyone was afraid with this guy. And he'd asked me a couple of questions. Now, my maths is terrible. And there must have been an angel sitting on my shoulder, because, you know, one, one makes uh, three in my book. But he turned around to me and really thought he put me on the spot. And he went, what's a... What's a, I hope I get it right. He went, what's a 919? So I went 181. Did I get it right? 171? I can't remember. So I got it right. Bang, went straight back. And I thought to myself, Jesus, where did that come from? Anyway, got the job, went on the stock market. 
it crashed a year later. I was out of a job. So um, went back into textile business, and, and from there I, I bought my first business. Uh, it was a set of market stalls from a gentleman that's in the audience, actually. And after that, I then pushed a bit further, launched a business called Compass International, which was an import and export business where I manufactured puffer jackets. Who remembers puffer jackets? Am I one bomber jackets? Um, well, I became the largest import and export in the country for those jackets at a very young, uh, young age. Um, very quickly built a business from a turnover in year one of 350k to about 3.2 million. Um, I was approached by Dun & Bradstreet for outstanding growth and fast track back then. We wanted to know what was going on. But of course I was over trading. Um, supplied many customers like Walt Disney and, and, and Tag McLaren. Some very, 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 very big businesses. Um, unfortunately, I was over trading. Um, Far East crashed in 98 and cost me everything. So after Compass International, I was devastated. You know, this was five or six years of, of what you guys are about to start in business. Uh, you know, it's 20 hours a day, isn't it? You're working out your front room, out your, your, your flat. You know, you're working from second-hand products and you've got limited uh, ability to fund your business. You're, you're using every single resource you're, you're borrowing and you're, you're, you're utilising and stretching the pound to its fullest extent. So basically what I did then was I went into sort of corporate recovery, uh, many sales teams, um, got very good at it. 2007, major point in my life, massive breakup with the old lady, my mother my children, very difficult time driving north on the M6, and I'm driving up for this interview um, for, for a retail, large retail company to become a sort of sales director um, with all the perks and all the trimmings. And I got off with the job and turned back around and come down and said, I don't want it. I'm going to start a company to help businesses because, my God, I just don't want people to go through what I've been through, the pain that I've been through. And I just think, look, if I could have got a load of people together and maybe we can all share our, our, our ideas, maybe things will change. So that was 2007. Um, so what compelled me to create, I just, I don't want people to go through the pain if I can ease it in any way. If we can, as a team, unite as entrepreneurs and share some of the thoughts and feelings we're going through, then perhaps some of the mistakes that we might make, you know, may well be, um, you know, prevented. Uh, Million Possible, the Entrepreneur Network, we're about 14 months old now. So we've created an online network for entrepreneurs. There's about 3,000 or so members. Um, we've not particularly used viral marketing. We have spoke to every single member that's come on board. And we've reached a stage now where the business is about to propel and about to move forward. Um, we've got the usual business forums and we've got blogs and we've got live chat facilities, um, which all help people to, to communicate. Um, business support services, access to funding through venture capital houses, etc. Some great free PR opportunities. And we've recently launched uh, a magazine which is in its fourth edition, which is called Rural Entrepreneur, which features entrepreneurs that have been through adversity, that are quite happy to talk about it, share their ideas with other entrepreneurs. Um, We've got an advertising website called Business Saucer and an association for entrepreneurs. Very small business uh, as a team of 12 or 13 people that work on it each day. Um, without them, quite simply, we wouldn't have what we've got now. We're looking to launch a school for entrepreneurs where entrepreneurs teach entrepreneurs and also we're looking to start sort of a face-to-face -face networking so we combine that face-to-face -face and online content so we can all learn from each other. Um, and much to the, the thanks of Rachel, uh, we've done trade shows uh, last year. Um, so, in short, online network for entrepreneurs, we've been through adversity, we faced adversity, we come out the other side. Mistakes, yes, it's inevitable. Yes, you're going to make mistakes, without a doubt. Yes, there will be a cost to you, um, but they're lessons. And mistakes are lessons. And if you can then use those lessons to move your business forward, you're more prepared when the time comes to face adversity. And I think if you talk amongst entrepreneurs, there's always going to be a solution to a problem that can help you out of most eventualities. Um, and actually, I'm more afraid of being nothing than I am of being something. So biggest adversity for me was giving up my job, giving up my comfort zone, giving up my income, into bankruptcy, losing everything, starting a business again for entrepreneurs with the vision that we could change the way that people view adversity, that actually it's okay to make a mistake. We all do them. Uh, make a mistake, learn from it, move on, okay? And together we're stronger. Uh, that's it for me, guys, actually, but I just wanted to see if I can get the bag decked out back down to the front very, very quickly. And thank you very much indeed, guys. You've just all put coins into a bag and we've closed you and you've been invested in something that you didn't even know what it was about, okay? Now, I'm not going to keep the money, but what I'm just going to prove to you is that it doesn't matter what you're selling. Sometimes it doesn't have to be anything. People buy into it. So I'm going to put it back down in front of the podium. Otherwise, it will be noted, donated to the business and the IP centre here at the British Library. Thank you very much indeed.